Good morning, church. Will you please bow your heads and join me in a prayer? O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I attended seminary in St. Louis, Missouri, and one of the advantages of going to that particular seminary is that it's actually very close, in fact, within walking distance of the St. Louis Zoo. The St. Louis Zoo is fantastic, and it's uh, one of the better zoos that I've ever been to. And even better than all of that is that a good chunk of that zoo is actually free. Uh, And so it makes for an easy escape from your academic study and kind of just peruse the grounds. And when you go into the St. Louis Zoo, you come across something that's known as Big Cat Country. And there in Forest Park, there was one of the biggest lions that I'd ever seen in my life. His name was Oba. O-B-A. Oba. Now, if there's a fight, I want to make it very clear that no matter what the issue is, I'm on Oba's side. And why is that? Because Oba weighed over 500 pounds. And Oba, as you can see there, boasts of a huge mane and has absolutely enormous paws. And now while many children certainly love the penguin puffin coast and there are others that cannot get enough of those gentle giraffes, for me, I like standing in front of the king of the jungle. That is, as long as he remains in his cage and at a very safe distance from me. Oba. Oba is Panthera Leo for you Latin lovers. He is king of the jungle for you nature lovers. And for us lovers of life, Oba must be behind bars. Now, I know Oba, yes, he should be free and he should be roaming through Forest Park having lunches and dinners of the little squirrels and bunnies and festering on the cycle of life. But really, who in St. Louis, Missouri wants to wake up to a lion alert? Who wants an up-close and personal visitation from that beast? Not me. And for that reason, the lion must forever remain in its cage. The lion must forever remain at a very safe and controlled distance. And you know what? I'm actually not the only one who feels this way. When we go back into the book of Amos, there is a guy named Amaziah. Amaziah is the high priest at a place called Bethel, the worship capital of the northern kingdom. And Amaziah, this high priest, well, he's building a career of keeping the lion in its cage. Only this lion's name is not Oba. This lion's name is the Lord. Even in Amos chapter 1, verse 2, the very opening of the book, the prophet announces, The Lord roars from Zion, and his voice utters from Jerusalem. You see, the last thing that Amaziah wants to see is a lion on the loose. The last thing Amaziah wants to have it give an alert of is that there's a lion out there. And so, whatever the cost, whatever the compromise, this lion, this lion that is the voice of the Lord, this lion that is the word of God, must never, ever rumble in Israel's jungle. Amaziah's policy means that anyone who rattles, anyone who shakes, anyone who opens cages must get the heck out of Dodge fast. And into this scene and into this controlled situation that Amaziah has set where no one at the temple in Bethel dares to raise their voice, where everything is very predictable, everything is very safe, everything is very comfortable, into this scene comes Amos a Judean cattleman, and a fig picker from a little town named Tekoa. 
Lion alert, lion alert, call 911 immediately. You see, Amaziah now has to go into safe church policy mode because it's through Amos that this lion is crying out to Israel saying, for three sins of Israel and for four, I will not turn back my wrath. And then the lion roars again and says, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your sins. And the lion roars again, saying, Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord, because it is a day of darkness, not light. Roaring, I hate, I despise your religious feasts. I cannot stand your assemblies. Still roaring, woe to you who are at ease in Zion, who do not grieve over Joseph's ruin. Oh, this is no still, small voice. And this is no Jesus, meek and mild. This is no tame, purring little kitty cat. In Amos chapter 3, the prophet announces, The lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? But Amaziah, the high priest, he will have none of this preaching hard truths to his people. Amaziah does not want the fierce, uncontrolled, unbridled word of God in the ears of his people. And so he comes to Amos, and this is what he says in chapter 7, verse 12. Get out, you seer. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and do your prophesying there. And when we interpret that passage from Amos chapter 7, verse 12, what Amaziah is really saying is, Hey, Amos, this temple isn't big enough for the two of us. So you get out of my face, you fig-picking, low-wadded, shepherd boy, prophet wannabe. Because my motto is let sleeping dogs lie. And Amaziah says, I long for people to cooperate. And to you radicals, to you who dare preach the word of God, to you who dare proclaim truth that is uncomfortable for me, well, to you I say goodbye. This priest, Amaziah, he's an expert in image building. He's an expert in marketing techniques and public relations, and he is a perfect salesman. In fact, in Amos chapter 7, verse 11, when he reports to his boss what this prophet Amos is preaching, Amaziah conveniently only includes a very negative account of Amos. And then he avoids all the sticky issues of synchristic worship, poverty, oppression, social injustice. And his king, Jeroboam ben Joash, will no doubt recommend that Amaziah get a raise After all, this priest at Bethel is running such a smooth religious organization. No testy meetings, no trifling matters. Amaziah keeps everybody content. But sisters and brothers, do not be deceived. There are powerful forces in our lives. There are powerful forces even in the church itself and even in our world telling us and shouting at us to be a clone of Amaziah. To be content with religious cliches. To be content with pious jargon instead of blazing, burning truth. It is remarkable what will happen even in a Christian congregation when the word of God is proclaimed and its truth, how its members will get very, very antsy and sometimes downright angry about it. But Amos responds to Amaziah by saying, look, I didn't get into this to make pious pronouncements. I didn't get into this to be on a platform. And so he says in Amos chapter 7, verse 14, I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet. What Amos means by that is I will not be bought. I will not be compromised. I will not be deterred, diluted, or delayed. 
I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice. I will not negotiate at the seat of the enemy. I will not pander to the pool of popularity. I will not meander in the maze of simple mediocrity. I won't give up. I won't back down. I won't let up until I am preached up, until I am prayed up, and until I am stayed up. In other words, Amaziah, I'm not shutting my mouth. Because I am sent here with the word from the Lord, and I will speak it. That is my call. That is what I am called and ordained to do, to preach the truth. And really, none of this should shock us, because Amos is just in a long line in the Bible of those who like to let the lion out of the cage. Moses. Moses confronts Pharaoh with the thunderous, let my people go. And Nathan, he courageously puts his ecclesiastical career on the line when he goes to King David after an adulterous affair and he points his finger at the king, the one in who holds his very life and says, you, you are the man. And Elijah takes heat from King Ahab. Ahab who says, Elijah is the troubler of Israel. He is the reason Israel has all of its miseries. And Jeremiah daringly rewrites God's word after King Jehoiakim slices and dices it and even burns it. And then there's Daniel's Daniel's dream of the night that shatters Nebuchadnezzar's illusion of the day. But joining this goodly fellowship of all of these lion loosers comes Israel's greatest radical, comes Israel's greatest truth teller. In fact, once he had the courage to make a whip and to use it to cleanse his father's house. And another time, he looked the religious leaders of his day straight in the eye and said, Woe to you, teachers of the law. You are hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs where you're so pretty and decorated and taken care of on the outside. But when we peek behind that veneer, when we go inside that mausoleum, you're just full of dead, rotten, disgusting bones. Climatically, then, he stands before the high priest of his day, much like Amaziah stood before the high priest of his day. And he says, in the future, you're going to see the Son of Man coming at the right hand of the Mighty One on the clouds of heaven. But the thing about this particular lion, this particular lion who was led on the loose in first century Galilee and Jerusalem, he's not only a lion. He's also the lamb. And his mighty power is made most perfect in his weakness. Jesus allows soldiers to march him along the Via de la Rosa where he shoulders his crossbar with blood dripping from his butchered back. And Jesus lets his executioner strip him naked, shove him to the ground, pin him to the wood with their tools of torture. And Jesus absorbs the spit like a sponge and he takes all of the insults asking his father not to dispense with those 12 legions of angels that are at his disposal. See, here's the truth about it. Societies do not execute Captain Kangaroo, Mr. Rogers, or SpongeBob. They're quite content with that light. But they do destroy people who shake the status quo, who challenge the establishment to their very core with real truth. There, they said on that Friday afternoon, there's no need to call 911 anymore. Put your phone down. There's no lion alert needed because this lion is crucified. He is dead and he soon will be buried. This lion has been silent. But then coming forth from the tomb, this lion does roar again. And this lion does rumble in his jungle. Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. See the lion of the tribe of Judah. He has triumphed. You see, there's nothing dead about our Jesus. He is no syrupy, sentimental kind of love. 
but his fierce love for you is driven by nails. It is marked with scars and it is crowned with thorns. Now I want you to imagine. What do you imagine the high priest Amaziah, who wants to keep everything pretty, wants to keep everything non-controversial. If it's a truth that might rustle your feathers and might give me an email in the morning, let's not do it. What do you suppose Amaziah would have said to Amos if Amos the prophet would have given up, if Amos the prophet would have given in and went along just to be a good old boy, just to keep his paycheck, just to keep things easy? What do you think this priest would say if Amos became his yes man to Jeroboam ben Joash? Well, Amaziah and all those like him in our day today would simply say, Welcome! Welcome to our religious country club where we simply pay our dues and get our way. Where our motto is, come weal or come woe, the status must forever remain quo. Welcome, Amos. Thank you for being our yes man. Thank you for never challenging us or ever allowing us to change and transform. But if we flip it, what do you think Amos would say to Amaziah? If Amaziah, upon hearing this unbridled, passionate, fiery word that is the word of the Lord, what if Amaziah would have heard it? And it cut him to his core. And he repented. And he said, enough is enough. And I will no longer sell my soul on the altar called compromise. What if Amaziah looked at Amos and said, you're right, Amos. It's time to let the lion loose. What would Amos say to that? I think Amos in our day and age would raise his hand. He'd make the sign of the cross. And he would look Amaziah in his repentant eyes, those eyes that once scowled at him, those eyes that once tried to undo Amos. Amos would look in those eyes and say, I forgive you. I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Word of God, it is a lion and it's ferocious but it's also transformational. And it's what enables us to look in the eyes of those who've cursed us, who spread rumors about us, who said things about us that aren't true, who want our demise, who want to silence our lips. It's what enables us to look at them and say, I forgive you. I forgive you. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, may keep your hearts and minds in the true faith unto life everlasting. Amen.